Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, Committee of the Whole meeting. Um, I, first of all, a housekeeping item, I would note that um, if, you picked up, uh, if you picked up an agenda at the back there, you might note that uh, it says Committee of the Whole for Wednesday, August 2nd. Actually, that's a typo. It is only Tuesday. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow, but today is Tuesday, and the agenda uh, below that heading is correct. So I uh, just want you to uh, not feel like you're in some kind of time warp or something. So it, it is Tuesday, and that agenda is correct. Uh, and first up on the agenda, we have um, uh, Representative Scott Lauser, who's going to talk to us about um, flood information mapping, and then we will proceed to the rest of the agenda. So, uh, Scott, please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Scott Lauser, um, representative of District 5, which is the southwest portion of Minot. I live at 1718 Birch Place, southwest. And thank you for the opportunity to present. I understand that um, the committee had me on the agenda previously. I was out of town. And so I appreciate being able to, to present today. And it is timely because the Ward County Commission did act earlier this morning on this issue give you a little bit of perspective in 2016 as the uh, as a realtor I served as the chairman of the national flood insurance the, the work group under the National Association of Realtors uh, insurance committee and we met with NFIP um, in Washington DC looking for solutions to the expiring flood insurance program uh, I'm sure many people are aware that the national flood insurance program is is about to sunset September 30th of 2017 now it's coordinating, as we know, with the new maps that just came out for the Minot area. Um, so we have a, a number of things that we can look at doing, but we, we are relying on Congress to act to extend the program in some capacity sometime before expiration. Uh, in that role, I, I uh, found some information out of the state of North Carolina, and I presented in House Bill 1020, which is a State Water Commission budget, two amendments that allowed for a mandatory study and that that bill as as the mayor and city manager and others will probably recall as they attended the hearings on behalf of minot uh, that passed the house intact um, the original intent of that bill before it was introduced the original intent was to collect lidar data across the state of north dakota 
and combine that with already existing da data to give to uh, a contractor in the state of North Carolina to build a website for property owners. And it, it was reduced down to four counties in a $50,000 appropriation. When that left the House, the Senate removed those two amendments and it went to conference committee. And within the conference committee, a representative Roscoe Striley from Minot reintroduced um, the concept and it was agreed to reduce the $50,000 appropriation to 30,000, a cost share between the State Water Commission of 15,000 and Ward County of 15,000 to set up a pilot program for Ward County only. And uh, the, the County Commission was presented that idea in early July and tabled the idea. Two weeks later, they brought it up again and tabled it. Uh, last Monday, I went to the Water Commission or the Interim Water Topics meeting in Bismarck to give them an update. And earlier today, the County Commission did pass um, a form of funding their portion of the, of the study, $7,500 to the county if the city agreed to pay $7,500. So that's where we're at as of this morning. Um, I'd be happy to, to talk about the, the concept, but I will show you if Derek wouldn't mind pulling up the website, I'll show you what this map looks like and a specific property and what can be done. State of North Carolina spent about 15 years rating every single structure in the state, every, every structure for its elevation. What FEMA does is they map locations. What we're looking at doing is mapping, adding the structure to the location. So we know based on LIDAR data, which is light data and, and ranging um, technology taken from above that determines the base flood elevation as it relates to that structure. And so if you look at this, in this particular property that's flagged in the yellow, this is the information that you can get from the state of North Carolina. The flood zone, uh, the type of structure that it is, the impacted structure, uh, combining with risk information for that property owner, what could happen over the, the, the chance of flooding, 10% chance, 4 to 1 and a 0.2%. The financial vulnerability, a property owner can input their income and determine what would happen based on uh, changes in flood insurance rates and of course the flood insurance and all this is built in in a public facing site. So it's my proposal that Ward County work with the State Water Commission, submit our data to determine whether or not the LIDAR that we've already collected in this area is sufficient for this purpose. Um, and and there's, there's much more that can be done with this website, but it's already in existence in another state. I've worked with their risk manager um, to determine that, that this could be done across the state of North Dakota, but the legislature focused down onto our county. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions the committee may have. Mr. Janser. Mayor, Mayor Brown. A uh, question for Mr. Lauser, a couple of them. Thanks, uh, Representative Lauser. Um, just a couple of very general questions for me. Um, this, this data that's collected, uh, it's obviously accepted by FEMA for their, for their program? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mayor, um, it, it, it has to meet a certain quality level criteria. And, and their LIDAR data is collected at about 10 different levels. And FEMA accepts quality level one and two. And as I understand it, some of the LIDAR that's been collected in 2010 may not meet that criteria, that threshold, but some of the LIDAR data collected in 2015 would. If I could follow up, Mr. Janser. Um, when you said the, that it was collected in 2010, collected by this organization or the data that was collected by us? By the county. Uh, in this case, the 20, I understand the 2010 data was the county. 2015 was in part the city. Okay, thank you. Uh, one follow-up, if I may. Um, the um, in our meetings with uh, representatives from uh, the flood insurance people, they were looking for uh, a certific certification for the data for the applicants. Um, who would house this, and, and would they been would they be able to provide that certification? That's necessary. Uh, Mr. Mayor, this would be housed by the state of North Carolina. We would be hiring a contractor to input the data from Ward County into their website with a front-facing website. Um, 
FEMA has accepted the data. Actually, the data is stronger from North Carolina than what FEMA has. I've got examples of where a FEMA map shows an exact property that doesn't even show a structure. But this data shows the structure because it collects the GIS data as well. Your built square footage, whether or not there's a basement, um, the, the boundary lines of the property. And so the purpose here would be multifaceted. Um, FEMA would then say to a property owner, you're mapped into the floodplain, therefore you have a requirement to carry flood insurance if you have a mortgage. In lieu of an elevation certificate to prove what the property owner may know, the report that would be gleaned from this website would take the place of the elevation certificate and thereby saving the property owner maybe $1,000 to $1,500. Likewise, if this data exists for our county and our city and somebody is told to get an elevation certificate to attempt to prove that their, base flood, that their elevation is higher than the base flood elevation, they could look at this information, see that they are in fact going to be mapped into the floodplain and there would be no need to spend the $1,000 and to waste the money. So this would work um, in both ways, in my opinion. And I, I hope that, that the county and the city sees the wisdom in doing this, and then it's something that the state could, could do statewide as a pilot project um, successful in Ward County. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, Alderman Strait. Uh, thank you, Chairman Janser. Scott, uh, Representative Lauser, can you explain why your opinion, I guess, of why the state would focus on Ward County and not include, say, Fargo, who's also had a huge flood event and something like this? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Strait, I, I would be just stating my opinion. Um, the original bill as introduced in the Water Commission budget included Cass County. Uh, it was Cass County, Burley County, Richland, and Ward. And, and for reasons that weren't told to me in the Senate, they were, they were removed. I was told um, after that happened that the administrators in those counties simply didn't want that information included. I see the benefit for whatever reason they didn't see the benefit and in an effort in that Water Commission budget to move ahead at least for the citizens of Ward County and Minot, we reintroduced it as part of a negotiation to get that bill passed. Just to follow up Chairman Janser, Scott, how then would you foresee this? Um, being funded, would this be a, an appropriation from the State Water Commission at, you know, via biannual? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Strait, yes. The original intent was to have this funded strictly out of the Water Commission budget. Uh, the North Carolina ongoing expenditures are funded by a transfer tax of real estate. If you recall in 2014, we voted on what, what was referred to as Measure 2 in 2014, and I was the author of that bill to place into our constitution a permanent ban on transfer taxes in real estate. We cannot go to the property tax owner or the property taxpayer or a participant in a transaction and tax them on the sale. It's against our constitution in North Dakota. This would have to be, in my opinion, uh, in my pursuit, would be upon successful completion of this project is to include that as a statewide project at some point going forward in the Water Commission budget. Thank you. Scott, just so um, if I could just ask, so uh, the, the state of, of North Carolina, are they, I mean, are they like gone into the business of doing this? Or, I mean, you mentioned a contractor. So, I mean, are they seeking additional entities or locations or states uh, or counties to enter into this program or how, what, what's the situation there? Oh, Mr. Chairman, this was originally proposed by the current risk manager in North Carolina in 2000. So it took them from 2000 to 2015 to rate every structure in their state. Since then, um, entities in Alabama, Virginia, and Florida have, have entered into some form of an agreement with North Carolina to build this or to use this site. I'm not sure their long-term strategy is, uh, necessarily to to make this a state or a nationwide portal. Um, what I do know is approximately 80% of their properties have seen reductions in their flood rates based on the information that they are able to provide FEMA as opposed to FEMA's maps. Okay. And 
I, you know, I, I know this. There's very few things that I think we can do with a federal program at the state, county, and local level. Um, I learned about the community rating system in October 2012 and brought that to the city. And um, thankfully, the, the city was able to get their application approved and Ward County to participate in that. That's one of the things that we can do to provide flood insurance discounts. There's very few other things. I looked into this uh, in the interim water topics committee four years ago. Um, I looked at a $100 million program, flood insurance program, run by the state of North Dakota that we determined would probably go broke based on FEMA rates within seven years. I think there's very few things that we can do as local or state elected officials to affect flood insurance, and this is one of the very few things um, that, that the state and the county can work on. Okay. Any other? Uh, Mr. Wolski. Chairman Janser, uh, thank you. Um, uh, this issue has been in front of the Ward County Commission for, for the last three meetings. It was tabled at, uh, at the previous two and, and brought forward today. And um, uh, I've had numerous conversations with Representative Lauser about this going back to the previous session. Um, and uh, uh, I appreciate what he's talking about here. I, I'd like to offer a motion that we, uh, that we enter into a cost share agreement with Ward County and and place seventy five hundred dollars into the preliminary two thousand eighteen budget uh, for consideration and, and advancement of this uh, mapping system concept pilot program. Okay, is there a second to that? I'll I'll second it to move to discussion. Okay, move and second it. Discussion on the motion. Uh, Mayor Barney. Uh, I, have, I don't have any more questions for Mr. Lauser, uh, so uh, I have a question for Mr. Meyer. But if there's, I don't want, if there's more questions for Mr. Lauser, I'd be happy to hold my questions until everyone was done okay. um, with their questions. Have any further questions for Mr. Lauser? Otherwise, we'll sort of trade out at the podium, I guess, for the for the time being. We can always we can always call uh, Scott back up if need be. Okay, thank you. Mayor Barney. Um, thank you, uh, Chairman Janser. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, when uh, when we were having those the meetings with the uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, you were you were designated as the what was your title? Floodplain administrator. Floodplain administrator. Thank you. Um, and as part of that role, you have to sign off on elevations, correct? That's correct. This could be a tool to help you sign off on uh, elevations. Is that true? Mr. President, uh, Mr. Mayor, I believe in some instances it, it certainly can. Okay. Um, in other areas, right now I don't think the data is there to be able to certify those elevations with just LIDAR. Uh, most of the time you're going to need a professional uh, surveyor to get that accurate of, of elevation data. If, if I could follow certainly. up. Certainly. Um, so, but as part of that paperwork, you just can't attach uh, this printout, it has to be certified by somebody like you in your position. Is that right, or how does that work? Mr. President, Mr. Mayor, um, what we do when we check base flood elevations within the department, for instance, a surveyor will bring us uh, elevation cert, and what I will do with the tools that I have right now is I have to scale off a map, and then I look in a, in a report with a cross-section, and then I can get within a tenth of a foot using that kind of data. With our risk map project that the, uh, the state and the feds have done, um, at the end of that project we'll get what's called a water surface 10, which means they generate a computer model with that actual elevation. So um, with a tool that the state is working on, I'll be able to click on a parcel and get that base fillet elevation instead of having to scale that off of a map. So that tool um, will significantly help us and will speed that application review from an hour to about two minutes. Um, that can be incorporated into a tool that Mr. Representative Lauser is talking about. Okay. If I could have one more follow-up and then I'll be quiet. The, um, but, you, but a person actually has to, has to sign off on that. I mean, the, the homeowner doesn't just attach a copy of this. Someone like you has to 
say I've looked at it as accurate or something like that. You're correct. I have to sign it. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for the city engineer? Thank you, Lance. You're welcome. Okay. Any other discussion on the motion? Alderman Smith. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chancellor. I guess uh, just initially, it's, uh, I agree with Alderman Kowalski. Clearly, we need to help our local citizens. I'm, I'm a little concerned going forward of ongoing costs, and I, I think that's going to be something that I'm sure is going to be um, flushed out over time. Um, I'm also concerned of the sheer workload that Mr. Meyer is going to have to go through as a result of this. So I think any tool that could benefit him to save he and his work and uh, I think would be a benefit. I'm, I'm not sure that all of that, how, how it all works together currently with what the state is developing, um, but um, I'm optimistic, I guess. But I am concerned about the costs. Can I ask just one more question of, uh, of uh, Representative Lauser, maybe? <clears throat> so, so, just to be clear, what's being entered into here uh, as the motion contemplates the, our contribution or our investment in this um, would be a, a pilot project. Is that, is that correct? I believe that's what you said. Correct, yes. And, and to try to just get a little more clarity about that, um, w w the result of the pilot project or what, what, do we, what do we get for our investment in the pilot project? the uh, a um, conclusion of whether it works or not or you know what I mean what, what at the end of the pilot project what what do we say aha that was what we were after uh, and primarily my opinion is one of two things would happen we submit the data and there is sufficient LIDAR data to impact the ability for a property owner to provide a letter of map amendment to FEMA to, to say whether or not they should be included, obviously to not be included in the floodplain based on the elevation of their structure. That would be the best scenario. Uh, the worst scenario, I guess, would be that it's determined that the LIDAR data combined with all the GIS da data that we have isn't quite sufficient enough and we would learn what it is that we need. At that point, we would know whether it's a state, the county, or the city what product we could provide our citizens and what it would take to do that, whether it be flying drones to collect new LIDAR data for this or other purposes, uh, what it would cost. I, I think the worst case scenario would be we, we would be told you don't, you're not quite there yet. And, and as a pilot project, we could try to research this ourselves or we could use the wheel that's already been created. And in the best case scenario, uh, if we find that the data is sufficient, we have a high enough quality level, then we would go into operation front-facing website for, North, for Ward County as soon as that's built into the site. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Or Alderman Wolski? Chairman Janser, thank you. I don't have any questions for Mr. Lauser, but I do have a couple of comments just on the general motion. Okay. Very um, good. Proceed. Sure. Thank you. Um, like I said, I've, uh, I've been involved in this conversation for the last few weeks in particular and, and brought the motion today and, and I'm going to support it when we get to uh, calling the question. But uh, I think there's been maybe a little confusion and, and there still is some uncertainty that remains as to what value this tool may be uh, available to citizens as it affects FEMA and our ability to perhaps uh, eliminate the need for an elevation certificate or uh, have what uh, a document that is in lieu of a, a elevation certificate. My hope is that FEMA would accept this data and this site, uh, but even independent of that, if they do not uh, endorse this product as something that allows us to deliver uh, a document in lieu of an elevation certificate, I think what we have here is a very well-constructed uh, user-friendly front-facing website that provides very valuable information to uh, Valley residents and those impacted by flood insurance rates um, and and so as I just evaluate the tool by itself uh, the $15,000 investment that that basically the c citizens of Minot and Ward County would have to make to me seems like a very 
a, a very good value. Um, as a second point, I, I think this is precisely how we deliver uh, a mechanism for government innovation. Um, as we have gone through this process a little bit, I think there is some hesitance on part of uh, FEMA individuals, State Water Commission individuals. I think that has been expressed uh, at the county commission meetings and other levels. Um, but I do feel like there, we, have to, we have to be willing to take some risks at different points in time if we want to see government evolve and, and innovate. And I think this is one of those tools where, where we may be able to see some of that innovation. Uh, and, and we don't get to experience that unless we're willing to take some risks. Um, as, a, as a third point, uh, I think we have an opportunity here to demonstrate a little bit of goodwill with Ward County. Uh, we've got some very significant budget challenges coming forward. We have the much bigger flood protection uh, issue to deal with <coughs> as a whole, the $336 million we were expecting to have to deliver locally for for flood protection and I think in order to accomplish that we're very likely going to need a partner in the county in some form or another. So, so this issue to me, uh, it's an opportunity to demonstrate some goodwill to, to let those folks know that, that we want to be in this together and, and we want to work through some of these challenges together. Uh, and so uh, that's one reason. And in closing, uh, I, I think Representative Lauser brought forward a very important point initially, which was that this this particular piece of legislation sits inside House Bill 1020. Um, it is in law. It has been signed by the governor at this particular point. And, and House Bill 1020 was pretty important for Minot. It, it delivered legislative intent uh, that over the next four, three or four bienniums, I'm not sure on the exact details, that the state is going to step up with $193 million. Uh, that's a pretty big commitment to, uh, to, to deliver on behalf of this community. This portion of the bill, while small, um, was endorsed by our legislators, and, and I think it's incumbent upon us to, uh, to stand behind uh, the intent of the legislature, the, the hard work of Representative Lauser and Straley, and, and make our commitment to seeing this pilot program uh, go forward and, and see how it's evaluated. So uh, with that, Chairman Janser, I just I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts. Okay, thank you. Mayor Byrne. I, I just have a couple of comments. Um, I, I think that uh, this project stands on its own and no no offense to my peer at the county but I think I have a good relationship with the county as it is and I don't need to um, we don't have to endorse this project to continue that goodwill and, and with regards to our relationship with the state we're very grateful I personally am very grateful for the for the support that we've gotten from our state and the support from our state legislators uh, particularly on those on those water bills because they were they were challenging, and um, they and, and our our, legis our uh, local legislators are very supportive and were instrumental in getting this through. Um, I think that this project is a very small investment, um, and uh, to to see if this is going to be a workable tool for uh, for our community and in particular for Lance, uh, who. Uh, is taking on those additional responsibilities. But I think that Alderman Strait brings up a good point and that we need to continue to look at the budgets and make sure that we're continuing to get value in subsequent budgets for this project. I suspect we will, but I think it's prudent to keep an open eye as we move forward. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Olson. Um, just one question. Maybe it's for the finance director. I'm not sure. I think the motion is that we would put this into the 2018 budget. Are there funds available now to pay for this? City manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Alderman uh, Olson. So as your budget gatekeeper, I'll tell you the budget's being printed currently. This has not been included in the budget. $7,500 seems like a small amount, but we've cut less than that out of the budget and uh, added it all up. I'll tell you this. Uh, my opinion about the project it doesn't have anything to do with the merits of the project or the investment or the return on the investment. It has to do with how to finance it. If the county was envisioned originally as the... Um, as a, as a sponsor, a financier of $15,000 for this, I'll just remind this committee that the, every single resident that resides in the city of Minot is also a resident of Ward County. And 
they pay Ward County taxes. And I just would want you to be mindful of that when another jurisdiction who taxes our residents continues to come to us and ask for additional funding for what is arguably uh, constituents that make up their own um, jurisdiction, that that's something we need to guard against. We, we don't have the luxury moving forward of, um, of budgeting the way that maybe we have historically. So that would be what I would suggest that uh, maybe I'd limit my opinion to at the moment on. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, I assume you're ready to vote. Call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? No. Padragula? Yes. Strait? Yes. Barney? Yes. Okay, motion carried. Thank you. Um, that brings us to uh, the balance of our agenda. Um, the um, uh, items uh, 17 and 18 are for discussion. Basically, uh, what are the wishes of the committee? Okay. And also eight. Okay. Um, I've been asked to pull items eight and ten, uh, which I assume means that there's going to be a motion for I move consent on the remaining items. Okay, there's a motion for consent on the remaining items, seconded by Olson. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, any Anybody else want any of the other items pulled? We have, um, we're gonna set aside item eight and 10 for individual discussion. There's a motion on the floor to um, pass the balance with the uh, staff recommendations as they came to us. Anybody in the audience or anybody on the uh, uh, committee want anything else pulled? Uh, Alderman Strait. Chairman Jansen, we pulled number 20 just for a point of clarification. Number please. 20, yes sir. Thank you. Okay, so um, we, have, uh, we have a motion for consent on everything except 8, 10, and 20, and then we'll have some discussion on a couple of those other ones. City Manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to mention that uh, we are going to discuss 17, 18, and 19 separately. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We'll, sure that was we'll, understood. Yeah. Those were for discussion and would be a, uh, yeah. Okay. Call the roll. Barney? Yes. Chancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Patagula? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Okay. Motion carried. That brings us to item eight, uh, the amendment three to the CDM Smith CDBG NDR project delivery contract. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Wolski. Second. Second by Strait. Discussion. Uh, Alderman Wolski. If, uh, if we could have Mr. Zakian come up, uh, just a quick question for him. Okay. Alderman Wolski, proceed. Chairman Janser, thank you. Mr. Zakian, uh, uh, just kind of pulling into your, uh, your memo here, uh, quoting, this will further define the monthly billing process by the contractor to acknowledge the oversight role of the NDR, NDR program manager on a month-by-month -month basis to determine contractor staffing needs and necessary work plan activities. Um, are we seeing you kind of take a larger role in the process here? Is, is that... Uh, part of this amendment? Um, Mr. President, Alderman Walski, yes. That is the intent. And to the credit of um, CDM Smith, they haven't blinked. They fully agreed with these additional terms. Um, and it's already being implemented. But yes, it means I'm going to have a greater uh, oversight on a month-to-month -month basis in terms of how they deploy their staff, the activities we're undertaking. Um, and they've accepted I'm going to have a much more accountable leadership role in all the different aspects of this funding. Terrific. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other uh, discussion? 
Alderman Pardewa. I would just echo that. If we're talking about a $20 million contract, I think we need to have some pretty good oversight on the part of the city. And it sounds like you have a whole lot of expertise in that kind of role, so I would feel much more comfortable. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Thank you, sir. Um, seeing none, call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Patagula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Arnie? Yes. Okay. Um, motion carried. That brings us to item 10. Move 10. Move. Second. Second by Olson. Um, discussion? Alderman, or excuse me, Mayor Barney. A uh, question for Mr. Zakian, please, sir. Sorry to have you. I need the exercise. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Zakian, um, I, I, I read through this and I just had some very general questions, uh, one of which was uh, I was curious that uh, there was a, such a, a prevalent role for economic development in our, in our, uh, our proposal to, uh, for NDR. And I was curious uh, if we would be able to use our current economic development arm, MEDC, as uh, in conjunction with what uh, the IEDC. Um, Mr. President, Mr. Mayor, uh, actually Stephanie is here. I see that. And uh, we've already met. Um, I will not speak for her, but let's just say we had a very productive meeting, and the intent of that meeting was to make sure they're very much involved in this activity. Uh, and I'm probably letting a little cat out of the bag, and I may embarrass Definitely. Okay. But um, she is well on her way to becoming a certified economic developer. Um, and I am one, and I've already indicated to her that I will be glad to help her move along the way. And that's all through the IEDC. But yes, I envision active roles for um, all the different economic development and business organizations. I envision a role for the chamber engaging with them, uh, the downtown professional association, uh, and the area development corporation. They're going to have very key roles. Mr. Janser, can I follow up? Thank you. Um, I, I'm glad to hear that. So you, you envision using the, the, the local economic development arm, and I assure you, you will have their cooperation uh, sitting on their board, as I do. Uh, and I was glad to, I'm glad to hear that. I didn't know if this, this organization was going to work in a vacuum, not recognizing the hard work we've already done, or if they were going to work together with the, the local organization. And that was the basis of my question. So um, thank you. If I might further just sure. quickly amplify that, because that is a good point. Mr. President, Mayor, um, indeed, um, and this, you know, it little gets in, a little bit into the weeds, but in the agreement, it stipulates that they will not reinvent the wheel. So they are going to work with all the established organizations and all the good work that the city has done, uh, the planning department has done, and these different organizations in the city have done, and they're going to build off that. Um, and they're going to bring in additional eyes and expertise that will simply work off of that and work with them and come back to this body with a recommended set of actions. Thank you. Alderman Wolski. Thank you, Chairman Janser. Mr. Zakian, uh, it, I apologize if this is a redundancy in terms of something that was in your memo, but, but upon the approval of this and getting this project started, what's the expectation in terms of time frame and, and having a draft to, uh, to consider? Um, normally this can take 12 months. Um, I have been on the other side of the table and I actually have been one of their professional experts that have been on these teams. So I know it can be done in eight or nine months. So my goal is to do it less than more. So I would say uh, no more than nine months we'll have a product finished. Um, the goal is to begin this process um, hopefully within the next two months. But it'll be up to their deployment of resources. I do not want to waste a lot of time on getting this going. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Street. Thank you, Chairman Janser. Mr. Zikian, under the uh, C, the fiscal impact, the project cost, the consultant agreement, 90000 and then we get down to the NDR Economic Resiliency Study. Can you remind us, is there more money that was allocated or awarded, the city won it, for fostering economic resiliency? I seem to believe that that was a, a line item. Is this the first step to that, or um, just can you clarify that? Mr. President, hold them straight. Uh, good question. Thank you. Um, we are actually, yes, we, the original plan for, for this type of study was going, there is budgeted 
just under three hundred thousand dollars so we're going to accomplish what was envisioned for the most part for ninety thousand dollars which then leaves us still with two hundred thousand dollars more that we'll be able to leverage um, and I'm just kind of talking ahead of time but we would be able to take that 200000 and based on recommended steps and actions that come out of this study, we'd then have some money to use to start deploying follow-up action. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Any other discussion? Seeing none, uh, call the roll, please. Barney? Yes. Chancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Patrick <coughs> Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Motion carried. That brings us to item 17, which is discussion of committee structure and composition. Um, Mr. Janser, I'd like to address that. Mr. Mayor. Uh, when, we, when we're forming the, uh, the, the new form of government, the, the city uh, authorized a subcommittee to uh, to kind of look at the interim process, how the committees are going to be structured, what the government would look like, what the ordinances were. And I think they did an outstanding job. Um, I think, though, that the current uh, standing committee structure could, could use another look. And I think that it's um, um, redundant to have the committee of the whole meet the week before the council meeting to hear all the items and then meet the following week to hear the, all the items yet again. What I think would be better, more efficient, and would include more public participation would be to have a, a split of the council so there's three representatives on uh, each of the standing committees and then make up the difference with however many the, the, the council feels is appropriate of, of lay people or citizens much like we used to do with the old airport committee. And I think that would be a nice way of getting uh, more people involved in city government and also uh, a way of uh, encouraging others that may want to run for council in the future. Um, I think the, it still speaks to the spirit of the change in government, uh, but I think it's more efficient and I think it includes more people, and that's why I asked to have this included on the agenda. Okay. And I, I, I offer it for uh, discussion. Okay. Anybody? <coughs> sure. Alderman Wolski. Chairman Johnson, Mr. Mayor, um, I'm glad to see an item like this on the agenda. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to, to some of these process discussions along the way in terms of evaluating uh, simply the best way to do business. Uh, a year ago when this, uh, when the ad hoc committee was meeting, uh, I, I was supportive of a concept very similar to what Mayor Barney has proposed today. I think there's, uh, I think there's a lot of strong points made in favor of, of that type of a, of a hybrid system whereby we get to include some members from the public, you know, use these committees as a little bit of a training ground in some sense. Um, there are a couple concerns I have uh, just in general, and it would probably be more a matter if we chose to, to rush into this, but I view government and, and what we're going through right now in terms of this transition is a little bit of an experiment. And uh, in order to, to fully flesh out whether an experiment has proved successful or not, we have to give it a little bit of time. And, and so the only thing I would be hesitant on is, is rushing to a change in the first few months of operating under this new form, which we were directed to do by the ad hoc committee. Um, so, so that's one, I guess, hesitancy that, that creeps up in my mind. Um, uh, the other issue that, that I have noticed over, over a few years of watching city government here is that our old framework of the, the finance committee and the public works committee, and those two in particular, from the outside often looked arbitrary. Uh, it was very difficult for me to determine why a particular item was brought forward on one, one agenda and, and on another agenda item. And so if we were to, uh, if we were to move forward and, and, and adopt some, some similar concept back to the, the standing committees that we've had in the past, I think it would be important to really try and clarify uh, 
uh, why particular items come onto a certain agenda versus another agenda because it's it has never been clear to me in terms of why those particular pieces happen and so um, anyway just some shot th some thoughts that that have occurred to me Alderman Strait um, thank you chairman Jansen I, I guess from my standpoint and I'm only going to speak for myself but the the initial committee of the whole here for me and I, I felt like I attended as many of the other airport committee meetings and finance committee meetings but I think it it certainly gives us a fantastic understanding of the issues to be able to speak to them in with the general public and um, the composition and the makeup I, I guess I'd like to see some things maybe uh, just progress along these lines for a little while I my thought not necessarily about the the makeup of the committees other than if we did have some other concerned citizens participate uh, I know Mayor Barney appoints a number of them and I the one thing I would like to see and I'm not asking Mayor Barney to do this but I, I'd like to know a little bit more about that individual that sits and comes before us uh, sure that could be on me to go out and solicit some of that information but I think for the general public you know we sit before a council meeting and hear the uh, the confirmations mm -hmm. the general public might not know some of those people and that that might be beneficial and uh, on, on just another thought on terms of the the structure and maybe it's getting a little away from the committee but it gets into council is we have these fantastic chairs up here I would love to give mr. Meyer and mr. Jonathan and mr. Lakefield and we could rotate somebody else in to maybe sit up here and they could face the public instead of have their back to the public um, so I guess that would be one thing I'd just like to throw into the fray of discussion. Mr. Um, I'm sure there are pros and cons against that. So. Mayor Barney. Uh, and and the, the, I'm glad to hear all this. Uh, my, my intent was to raise the issue, create discussion. I think we've already gone into the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but I would like to keep the discussion and maybe uh, direct the city staff to, to begin looking at this at a very high level. And I think that addresses everyone's concerns in terms of the logistics. I think it, it addresses Alderman Wolski's concerns about the timing and begin moving and talking about the, the committee makeup. So um, I don't know that we even need a motion to have this, the city staff begin looking at that. But I wanted to, to broach the subject with the rest of the council and uh, get their input. So I thank you for all of that. Okay. Uh, city Attorney, you have. Some input? Um, President Dancer and members of the committee, just as a reminder, the ad hoc committee passed a resolution and the council actually passed the same resolution which indicated that um, when the new council is seated to continue that this makeup, the committee of the whole makeup in those dates shall continue for the months of July and August, at which time the new city council shall determine its committee format and schedule by resolution. So we do need some direction if the council wants to continue the committee of the whole we can amend the resolution to continue the dates for as long as as the council wants to do that but the direction from that ad hoc committee and the former city council was for the new city council to determine how it wanted to conduct business. Understood. Mr. Mayor. I would propose a motion then that would perhaps address both issues. I would propose a motion that the city council continue doing business in the format that was dictated by the ad hoc committee but at the same time have the city staff investigate the possibility and the logistics of uh, of alternative styles or alternative uh, format second. Okay. second by Olson discussion of the motion Alderman Strait Chairman Janser uh, Mayor Barney, could you give us uh, in your uh, idea what would be a timeline where you'd like to see this change take place? I, I guess I don't have a time frame in mind. I wasn't aware of, or if, if I was aware, I've forgotten the uh, the resolution of, of July and August. Um, I, that's why I extended it beyond that, so so that we did have time to do due diligence and make sure that we. Our next step is, um, is is as good as we can. So, so I, I don't have a, a time frame in mind. 
in um, just in point of clarification, so the the motion would be that the um, that these uh, structure uh, from the ad hoc committee that that we've been using would essentially continue until it's changed. I guess is is that a yeah, fair statement? Yeah, exactly. And, and if I could follow up on that, certainly. I think you know from a practical point of view, the city staff is is overwhelmed with the budget process right now. So I, to, to think that we're going to be making much progress prior to October isn't very realistic. So I think that uh, we're looking at a October, November time frame at the earliest. Okay. Alderman Olson. I do support this motion because I do believe that the committee needs to be divided. I agree with Mayor Barney's original comment about redundancy. And so I, I would like to see this committee split. I would like to see some more interaction um, from other community members. And I really sense that this is our responsibility. It's not city staff's responsibility. So I, I think that the decision should be made here. I don't think it's something that we do put back on the shoulders of city staff. Okay. Alderman Barney. Oh, I don't think the decision would fall back on city staff, but I think we need their expertise on the legalities of forming the committees and um, get their valuable input. I mean, obviously, it's going to be up to us and to uh, put it together, but we really do need their expertise, in my opinion. If, if I could just comment, um, remembering back to some of the discussions of the ad hoc committee, um, you know, uh, this um, this kind of structure that's that's uh, been suggested was talked about a bit, and. You know, there, there are certainly, like, well, like with any of these structures, there are pros and cons. And, you know, they, they, um, they function well um, for ad hoc committees. I think it was noted that, that that's a process or a structure that, that works pretty well for certain things. Um, and, and several of us have chaired those in the past on, on topics that were important. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, some of the citizen members who are not elected folks, you know, have a, have a little different uh, sense of their participation as well. And so there's uh, potentially some question marks about that. But I, I think, if nothing else, th this motion um, uh, provides an opportunity to look at those things and to kind of determine whether that's something that we would want to do or whether it's something that we would um, ultimately back away from and, and continue in a different way. So um, I guess I'm going to support the motion. Any other discussion? Mr. Chair. City Manager. Thank you. Uh, just a point of clarification. Uh, how many options does this committee want us to look at? Do you want us to investigate the option that uh, Mayor Barney has suggested and, and provide you some feedback on that uh, at a time certain? Are there other options you'd like us to look at? Um, it would be most helpful if we could limit the scope of this work uh, with some sideboards, if you don't mind. Okay, Alderman Barney. I, I, I would suggest that um, you focus on the budget until October 1, and then we can uh, maybe even bring this up at another one of our Committee of the Whole meetings or at a council meeting, whatever you want. And this will give members of the, the council the opportunity to chew on this a little bit and then uh, maybe offer more suggestions at that point. But it, right now, I, I'm not bringing this up to, to make it immediate, because I, if no one else in the world understands your workload, it's me. <laughs> And, uh, and everyone out there, and uh, so I want to make sure that we can do this in a, in a, uh, a thorough fashion instead of an expedited fashion. So um, that would be my answer. Okay. Yes, that's very helpful. Satisfactory. Thank you. Okay. But October 1st. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, any further discussion? If not, uh, let's call the roll. Barney? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Patagula? Yes. Strait? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Okay, uh, that, that brings us to item 18, which is um, uh, sort of follows on that topic, which is the uh, Committee of the Whole schedule. And uh, I guess um, if you remember uh, when, when uh, we um, 
when we first came out of the activities of the ad hoc committee on new government um, there was some schedule contemplated and then based on uh, kind of what had been done previously and what kind of the city staff recognized uh, would work we uh, adopted the schedule that we've been operating under for the last several months and uh, so now uh, as the city attorney pointed out it's time that we um, uh, determine what we're going to do going forward with with that uh, situation and so um, if somebody has a motion they'd like to make uh, we could move forward on something or uh, if you have a, a suggestion uh, that you want to talk about we can do that Alderman Padregula. I had a question. Um, originally, I think we were going to have a couple weeks between the Committee of the Whole and the Council meeting, and there was, I think the City Manager pointed out that we needed to kind of shorten that block, and I, I never quite understood why we wanted to, to leave less time. One of the things I've noticed is that between committee meetings, things get generated, ideas, questions, concerns, and it's very important, I think, that City staff have ample time to come up with answers and for us to think stuff through. Um, so I guess I've always struck me as odd that we would you know keep that time very condensed um, could, could could the city manager somebody explain to me why why we need to have minimal time between the committee of the whole and the council city manager thank you mr. chair alderman Padragula it's a matter of process in regard to the way we uh, either pay our bills approve bids and other sorts of things uh, the process that we currently use as a city requires us to go through the committee first and then to the city council because we hold the council meetings only once per month the committee meeting if it was to be held or if the committee meeting was to be held let's say two weeks earlier then we'd have potentially a gap where we missed the committee of the whole meeting and then had to wait bypass that council meeting and go to the next committee of the whole meeting to get that that item heard to then make the next council meeting so when we evaluated that process time it was going to take us much longer to get through um, certain types of city business which is why we recommended going to that condensed or keeping that condensed schedule but keeps the business actually flowing more quickly and doesn't stall approvals or whether they be bid approvals plat approvals uh, financial approvals or whatnot that helps okay Alderman Strait? Yeah, Chairman Jansen and Alderman Padrigula, I think the second point of it was also when we discussed it at the ad hoc uh, government restructure committee was also to give city staff some time um, away from the meetings and the organizing of the meetings. So we were trying to be as efficient and not have them have multiple other obligations in the lead up to meetings. So I think that was part of the process as well in keeping with the timeline. Okay. Um, with oh, Alderman Wolski, I, I guess I just have a question uh, um, for for city manager and, and perhaps Kelly. Is this uh, the manner in which we are we are doing this right now in terms of the Tuesday Wednesday before city council? Um, in your guys' opinion, in terms of what you would look for, is this still the schedule that you guys would appreciate the most, uh, or is there some alteration to the concept that might provide for a little more uh, efficient business? getting done or more convenience and crafting agendas and things like that it, it does feel like occasionally to me the the job of simply getting the minutes out and the agendas crafted on this Tuesday Wednesday schedule and then uh, the the Friday release of the agenda for the Monday meeting feels almost too condensed at times but but this is one area where I'd be happy to defer to, to what you guys think is the best way to operate city manager you want to respond to that one? thank you thank you mr. chair Alderman Wolski it's really just a matter of preference in regard to processing here I've, I've worked in cities where there's council meetings every week uh, of the year and those get very tiresome for the staff who put in hours and hours after hours and then of course the committee meetings in advance of those I'm not recommending that but uh, in regard to the way that our organization has been set up and kind of has been moving its business along everyone's conditioned pretty well to the process that we have uh, I'm not saying it's maybe the best process, but it's certainly a process that works for us. Uh, in regard to not getting things or feeling rushed, like on a Friday, I can guarantee you working in all those other cities where we've had meetings every week, there is always an item that comes up on a Friday afternoon that we try to squeeze into the agenda 
by that next Monday or Tuesday's meeting. So that won't go away depending, you know, by changing simply the dates or, t or, or sure. days of the, of the meetings. That will always happen. We get late agenda items all the time. Uh, I think, you know, if, if, if you as a committee and, and ultimately a council want to keep a once a month council meeting, uh, the process that you have seems to work okay. Um, if you want to go to two council meetings per month, which some cities do, and have alternating committees in between those or a committee in advance of one of those or turn one of those council meetings into a budget work or not a budget a a general council workshop where you only hear issues but don't decide on issues and then make the decision at the next council meeting that's kind of how your committee the whole thing's working now just be moving up that date by a week i mean like i say there's a number of ways to do this but the short answer is everything works fine right now if you keep a once a month council meeting and you want items to go through a committee of some kind uh, we'd recommend keeping that committee right before the council just so that we can keep business moving through once it enters the process in a timely fashion. Alderman Strait. Thank you, uh, uh, City Manager Barry. I, I guess, Mr. Janser, with that, I, I would make a motion that we maintain the current schedule of uh, Committee of the Whole meetings uh, with City Council following that following Monday through October which would allow us to then discuss further uh, Mayor Barney's suggestions of how we might structure um, changing a few things. Second. Seconded by Olson. Um, Mayor Barney. Uh, I agree with the concept. I think through October may not be long enough. If they don't start working on the, 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 stru the potentially revised structure until October 1 maybe the end of November would be so maybe I could make an amendment to your motion to November absolutely okay or um, Alderman Strait do you want to just if you and your second agree to changing the timeline on your motion um, we could handle it that way that's fine sir that's fine okay okay any further discussion all right, seeing none, call the roll. Straight? Yes. Chancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Okay, that brings us to uh, item 19, airport activities and uh, updates. Airport director, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairman Chancellor, Alderman. Um, I will let you know up front uh, that this presentation is perhaps a little bit longer than you're used to. I'm sorry that we're at the end of the evening. I will try and make this go as quickly as possible, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to uh, make sure I covered with you tonight. Um, first, I'll go through the uh, numbers as we typically do. Uh, for June this time. Um, then we have an ongoing issue at uh, the airport with a taxi cab company that, is, or not a taxi cab company, a rental car company uh, that is not licensed to operate at the airport. And uh, I've been dealing this with dealing with this um, for four to six weeks now. But I understand that um, this organization has reached out to some of you individually, so I thought it would be uh, prudent for you to hear from the airport on the issue. And then last, lastly, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about airport finance and in particular um, uh, revenue for the airport. We won't go into uh, deep detail, but I think it uh, is a good time as we come to the budget uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with airport uh, uh, finance. Um, as uh, as others who have been around a while that I can just give you a quick update on on how we operate that way so with that I will try and be uh, respectful of your time but also answer all of your questions so if there's anything that you need to stop me with please go ahead uh, so for June uh, in plane passengers uh, June was actually our biggest month so far just a couple uh, about a hundred passengers more than our March enplanements um, and above 2016 our load factor uh, has remained constant in June for the last three years. So we're, uh, although we're down a little bit from May, we're kind of right where we, we typically are for June over the past three years at uh, about 73%. Rental car activity, 
uh, was up from um, May uh, seasonal and uh, is right on track with where we were in June of uh, 2016 as well. Uh, the concession slide has gotten a little busy and I will unbusy it before next time, but I wanted you to uh, see um, that the mag has been moved. Uh, so the purple line that you see is the 2017 minimum annual guarantee. Uh, and I wanted to compare that to the 2016 minimum annual guarantee. So these contracts typically um, increase the mag amount uh, over year over year. Um, so uh, the uh, Oakwell's food and beverage concession is doing very well. It's uh, down a little bit uh, from May, uh, but right where they were in June of 2016, although they are a little bit below their minimum annual guarantee. So uh, what that means is for June, they'll pay us at the, uh, the purple box uh, rather than the green triangle. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, we, as, as you've heard me say many times up here, um, we always want our, our business partners to uh, perform above the minimum annual guarantee. That means that they are uh, doing well as a business and uh, that we're making more than uh, we originally budgeted for. Um, in this month, um, they didn't quite make it, but I think they've got a good business model and I think we'll continue to see uh, good performance with our food and beverage. Uh, parking revenue uh, was good um, compared to the previous two years for June, uh, down a little bit uh, in May, but uh, we're, we're beating kind of the seasonal, the seasonal average there. We had a good month. Okay, so that brings me to the second part of the presentation. So um, we've got an issue um, with a car rental company that is operating uh, at the airport. And what I'll do here uh, without, uh, without a license, and what I'll do here quickly is uh, tell you what's going on, uh, why it's a problem, um, what options there are uh, for this uh, proprietor to uh, get in compliance. Um, I will cite the applicable uh, code and federal references, um, kind of chapter and verse, as to uh, why this is a problem or, or why we can't uh, have it continue, and then talk about our plan to action uh, briefly. So here's the situation. Um, a car rental uh, concessionaire at the airport came to administration and uh, made a complaint to us that there was a car rental company that was uh, dropping cars off in our short-term parking lot uh, and then uh, their customers would come and uh, go out to short-term, pick up the car, the keys would be left unlocked and in the unlocked vehicle, the rental contract would be in there and the parking ticket uh, and they would simply go and, and exit the parking lot, uh, pay the parking ticket, and, uh, and go on their way. Um, we checked into this and found that that was indeed what was going on. Um, so this was a complaint that was brought to us uh, by the car rental companies. Um, I talked to the proprietor of this um, business after that to explain um, that that was not uh, permitted, uh, that um, you know, we, we couldn't have unlicensed or uh, businesses that did not have a concessionaire agreement um, operating at the airport. Um, and I also uh, gave a couple options for, uh, you know, what they might be able to do in order to operate successfully and legally at the airport. Uh, that call did not go particularly well. Uh, that was not uh, information that was well received and the proprietor then uh, made contact with the city manager, or I guess the mayor first, uh, uh, the mayor. Uh, mayor Barney had a meeting uh, with the proprietor uh, and then subsequently uh, city manager Barry uh, met with the proprietor as well. I was not in person at, uh, at either of those meetings. Um, and I believe that uh, in the city manager meeting, from what I understand, um, you know, uh, the options uh, were provided as to what this uh, proprietor could do to be in compliance and also uh, the city manager answered a lot of questions about uh, why what was the, you know the, the current business model and why that was not uh, permissible. Um, since that I've had several more um, unproductive phone calls with the proprietor uh, and uh, essentially um, what I'm hearing is that you know we're going to continue to do this uh, and this is not something that you can regulate. 
So, and why, uh, and, and again, these phone calls I've had have not been terribly productive, but uh, this is, uh, this last bullet point is my uh, kind of take on the, uh, the reasoning that the pro proprietor has. And, and again, I can't speak uh, for them, but this is, this is what I've been told on the phone. Um, so first of, all, uh, first of all, the parking lot is a public, public parking lot. Anybody can use it for any purpose, and if they want to drop rental cars over there, that should really be no business of the airport. Um, and if it is, it's, but it's not really a business because they're not doing any paperwork or there's no money changing hands in the parking lot. So the, the contract is left in the car and nobody signs anything. They just walk out to the car and go. Um, they pay the parking fee. So they do get a ticket and, you know, unless they're there less than the half an hour that we uh, give you free at the airport, which I know in a lot of cases these cars are dropped off just prior to the, the airplane landing. So in a lot of cases there, there isn't any parking revenue because the first half hour is free. But in those instances where they do pay a parking fee, they, you know, that parking fee should be uh, compensation enough to, to the airport. Um, and then um, this is, the, you know, they say they've been doing this for a number of years, uh, that nobody's ever questioned this before. Um, and that um, they should be allowed to continue. I can't really speak to that. As you know, I'm, I'm fairly new. I have heard uh, anecdotally that, that perhaps that isn't the case, that perhaps we've, we've kind of gone, gone around this, this merry-go-round before in the past, but I, I don't know that for sure. I think during the um, time when the um, boom was going on and there, were, uh, there was no place to park and people were parking in fields and ditches and everything else, I think there was some, some issue going on at that point too. And then lastly, that uh, they're a small business um, and really they're, they're not renting enough cars to hurt the, the big boys that are out at the uh, airport and that, um, you know, what the, the business they do is really inconsequential to, to the overall plan. So why is this a problem? Um, several reasons. The airport requires a, uh, either a license or a concession agreement before uh, anybody can operate, operate a business on the property. And I'll go over some of the reasons why it's important to have a license or a concession agreement uh, for the city, for the public uh, in, in a minute. Um, I will say that uh, providing a rental vehicle for pickup in short-term uh, parking is indeed running a business. Uh, whether or not uh, money changes hands there, whether or not um, uh, the rental agreement is signed there, uh, the parking lot is indeed part of the uh, airport. Um, we manage that for revenue purposes uh, and if you're in there having people pick up cars, that is indeed a business that you're operating at the airport. People, that, you know, this, this company advertises airport pickup uh, on their website. So the airport is being used um, as, a, uh, as part of their business, which would imply that the airport somehow endorses their business. Um, the current rental car com com companies, excuse me, um, bid for the right to do business at the airport. And so you hear me talk month in and month out about the MAG. I just gave the presentation about uh, what the rental car revenue was. Uh, and that MAG, that minimum annual guarantee, is contracted uh, at the low end at $168,000 per year and at the high end at $288,000 per year. So that's the commitment that these other car rental companies have made uh, to the airport and to the city. Uh, and in return for that, one of the things they expect is that uh, the agreement that we made with them um, is enforced and that as the airport manager I will look after their interests if somebody comes in and tries to run a business that is in competition with theirs uh, at the airport uh, at more favorable terms than what they have been uh, uh, signed up for. They also, the licensed vendors or the licensed concessionaires also collect a three dollar for and fifty cent per rental charge uh, called a uh, uh, facility fee um, and this CFC is used to finance um, airport projects that are rental car related. So you've heard me up here talking for some time 
about our investigation of a quick turn facility at the airport, uh, some, a consolidated place where uh, rental cars could be returned, uh, turned and cleaned and rented again. Uh, this $3.50 fee goes into a, uh, an account and that's how we will finance part of this, uh, part of this project. If you're running a car rental business out of the parking lot, uh, that $3.50 uh, charge is not being collected on our behalf. Uh, rental car companies also pay lease for space in the terminal, uh, which is very important to us, and they also uh, pay uh, separately for parking spots uh, for their uh, return vehicles and their ready vehicles. Uh, a car rental concession agreement also allows the airport to guarantee to our customers uh, a certain stand level of standard um, and uh, protection for the city. So the car rental uh, uh, contract that um, Hertz signs, for example, um, says that they must provide a uh, vehicle that is uh, two model years old or newer, uh, that it be safe, clean, and known from, uh, free from known defects. Uh, and um, we don't have any control over what kind of vehicle somebody would just leave in a parking lot. But if somebody were to uh, come to the airport and rent a car uh, and go from the airport, you might think that um, they would assume that because it was rented at the Minot Airport that it was going to be safe and met all sorts of uh, conditions. Uh, and we don't know that that's the case if we're not able to enforce that. Uh, we also require our car rental uh, concessionaires to have uh, adequate liability insurance to protect the city. Um, and they're subject to audit by the city, which we do. The last thing I want to mention here is that this is not something that um, Minot made up. This is standard industry practice. You cannot go and run a car rental uh, business out of the parking lot of Minneapolis or Chicago or even Fargo or Grand Forks or Bismarck. This is, this is how airports are run. Um, they protect the businesses that are done uh, on premises. Uh, and those businesses are regulated through licenses and uh, contracts. So what can they do? Here's what we've offered them at this point. Um, if they want to pick up customers at the airport and essentially shuttle them off-site to their facility, they can do that. We have a license for that. Um, it is similar to what um, the licenses, license fees we collect from all the hotels, from all the taxi cabs. There is a, uh, a private corporation, well, maybe a public corporation, but a, a business in town that picks up uh, a large number of employees on a regular basis. Uh, they pay uh, this licensing fee. So if they want to uh, operate at the airport, um, you know, this particular license is $600, and they could transport their customers off-site to where the rental cars are. Also, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be, uh, the, another alternative is in a, in a couple of weeks, we will be offering uh, a RFP. And so if they want to bid on the business at the airport, uh, we would be happy to evaluate that proposal along with the other car rental companies and they could uh, operate legally at the airport. Lastly, I'll just, uh, more for Reference. I certainly won't read all these to you, but there is uh, there is sufficient uh, code uh, and law uh, to back up what I'm telling you here. Um, the uh, code of ordinances for Minot, um, the rules for operating ground transportation services, uh, the FAA compliance manual regarding self-sustainability, uh, self and I'll be uh, thrilling you with more on self sustainability momentarily when we get to the finance portion of this presentation. Um, we operate under uh, grant assurances from the FAA. So as you know, and as I'll explain more, a lot of what we do, all of our capital projects are financed to a great degree by the FAA. And when we accept their money, we accept to do business in a certain way. Uh, and it's not just about whether the runway lights are white or blue. Uh, it is also about um, the way we conduct business at the airport, and this would be in violation of that as well. And lastly, uh, the current car rental concession agreements that we have with our 
our current concessionaires uh, prohibit us from offering a better deal uh, to somebody than they have contracted for. And this would certainly do that. So uh, it has been our hope and is still our hope uh, that this business will um, comply with our request to stop using the parking lot uh, and to uh, use one of the options that we presented to them. Uh, in the case that that does not happen, uh, the city attorney uh, and the city manager and I have worked on a cease and desist uh, letter uh, that will be presented to this business um, requiring them to, uh, to stop this. May I answer questions? Alderman Strait? Uh, just for a point of clarification, this is a rental company, car company, off-site, renting a vehicle to someone arriving at the airport. <coughs> they, in theory, have uh, signed some forms, insurance documents prior to landing and are driving a vehicle away. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Security. Alderman Strait, that is my understanding as well. Alderman Potter Gula. Another question or a couple questions maybe. Um, is there a limit on the number of companies that could operate at the airport? You've mentioned a, an RFP kind of thing. Um, is there a limit on that? Uh, Chairman Janser, uh, Alderman Padragula, we decide, we decide that during the uh, contracting period, so the last time that was decided was in 2012, and so we have this RFP that goes out and um, we um, decide how many we're going to pick. We obviously pick the, the best proposals. Currently we have uh, four companies operating five different brands uh, at the airport. Um, we could open that up in this next uh, round to more. We could make it less, uh, but it kind of depends on the, um, uh, the responses we get. But yes, we do have the ability to limit it. We don't have, to, we don't have the space to, to have an infinite number of car rental companies. Would it be correct to assume that we would choose the companies that, um, again, the lowest and best bid, in this case the highest and best bid, that have you know, minimum qu good qualifications, a good reputation, and also <coughs> can promise us the most income. Uh, uh, Chairman Janser, Alderman Pyrogula, yes, that's that's correct. We would want uh, companies that could comply with the standards that we have in the uh, in the contract, um, and uh, would be able to offer the types of vehicles that uh, that rental car customers want to rent. Yes. Thanks. Is um, uh, is there a um any kind of you know sort of customer preference uh, component to that at all? I mean, in, in other words, um, you know, people are used to renting vehicles from, you know, you mentioned Hertz or National or Enterprise or you know, people. I mean, uh, where those companies have a you know uh, national network or that you know they're they're a, a company that. Um, you know, offers cars in a lot of locations around the country. Is there any any of that considered? Uh, Chairman Janser, yes. While it's not exclusively considered, uh, certainly, um, you know, you would want to look at car companies that may have uh, relationships with uh, airlines that fly into your airport. So, if Hertz and Delta have uh, have a mileage agreement. Uh, that uh, is attractive um, to some degree, although I think my responsibility is to um, the enterprise and making, you know, while well, customer, uh, customer satisfaction obviously is an important part of that, the financial uh, component is important as well. So um, we would look at the, the, you know, the highest levels of service combined with the highest minimum annual guarantee. Okay, thank you. Any further questions by Members of the committee. Yeah, Chairman Johnson, thank you. Uh, is this a question, uh, or, or is there a need to to improve our policy in some way, shape, or form? You know, I think there's a tendency in business in general to to see the laws on the books and 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 look for a way around them. That's a pretty natural reaction, I think, in in private market. And uh, is this a situation where we need to? To, to beef up our own policy in some way, shape, or form, uh, to, to give you guys some, some stronger tools in enforcing this, or is this a pretty clear-cut case of, 
uh, again, I'm looking for opinion, I think, here. But. Yeah, uh, uh, Chairman Janser, Alderman Welski. Uh, you know, I think, I think what we've got pretty well defines what, what the policies and procedures are. I don't think there's a lot of gray area in here. I mean, certainly if we had a verse that said, you know, off-site car rental companies are only permitted under the following circumstances, that would, you know, that would really shut the door on it. And so uh, that is something we, we might take a look at. But I think there's, there's sufficient precedent um, for us to make this call with what's on the books now. Okay. Thank you. Any, okay. any further discussion? Uh, sir? You want to come to the podium, please? Uh, my name is Charles Herman, and I'm here for M&D Rental, and Mary Bitkus is who you're talking about. Um, first question I'd like to know is, answer to is, who are the car reg uh, rental companies that are yelling about her operating a business out of the parking lot? Because she's not operating out of the parking lot. She is doing it at her business. She has a contract with Enbridge, uh, Amaretta Hess. These people go to her before they even come to the airport and book their cars. When they leave the, her site, it is their responsibility for that vehicle. They own that vehicle at that time. So how is she operating a business out of the parking lot? He is talking about a fixed business that is inside the terminal. She's asked for copies of the rules and the regulations, and she's got nothing. I've got letters where her emails asking for what codes and what they are. Nothing's been provided. Uh, she, one was he sent a PDF file of the FAA book for 600 pages. Where do you find it in 600 pages? There's nothing there. It all goes to avionics on the other side of the fence. Uh, we, uh, she just can't understand what the big fuss is about. If it's if, she, if it's going to be her, are you going after rent a rec Murphy Brothers, or Murphy Cards? Um, there's other businesses in town that are doing it, but it's only her that we're hearing about. And uh, uh, I think she deserves to get copies of these codes and, and FAA regulation that says she can't do that. I guess that's all I can really say. It's, uh, she's asked for permission. She's even asked for, okay, what are the rates so uh, we can work something out? Nothing's been replied to. Mr. Chair. Mr. Manager. Uh, I'd like to respond to that because I've had several email exchanges with Mary. I have all copies right here. And we can, we, you can search my email too. And she's been given those copies multiple times by myself, by the airport director, and by the mayor. Where you had them up on here where it says C section 4, paragraph A? She hasn't gotten them. She asked for Pacific. Uh, Rule or copies of the rule. She's never got them. How do you how do you go through? Can you go through a 600 page book and say, okay, this is where it is? She I, the one that you guys did send. I look through. I can find the rule, but it all replies to avionics, not for car rentals or anything like that. You know, I, as I remember, there was a, the uh, airport director just had a slide up that right. um, essentially seemed to um, provide what you're asking for. We can certainly furnish that to you. Yeah, it says Section 46E City Code. Why didn't he send that to her? Mr. Chair, 
that was sent to her. The emails are clear with that. I have if, copies of it. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe there is an email snafu of some kind, but uh, that information was sent both by the mayor and myself. Okay, then I guess basically on her behalf, I'm asking the city to send her copies of the rules that you guys are stating and then also a proposal for a licensing fee for her to do that. Uh, if Enterprise hurts and these guys can't get national contracts, what's she supposed to do? You're gonna, that's a private business and why not? Mr. Chair. Proceed. So as the airport director mentioned the rfp is coming open here in just a little while and this firm like any other firm in the city is welcome to submit a proposal that the city will evaluate against the merits of the criteria and every other uh, organization or company that submits she's not renting to the general public i, I understand that's your opinion she is sir. renting no that's not my opinion she has got a national contract or a state contract, if you want to call it that, with Amaretta Hess and, and uh, the gas company out in Tioga. That's who she's doing her business with. Sir, the business is being conducted on the facilities of the airport. That makes it no, illegal. Not. It's, against being it's being done at her, at her place of business. They oh. call her up and say, we need a car at the terminal at four o'clock Tuesday afternoon she says okay fine who's driving it she fills out the contract they give her a credit card and they say now can you deliver that to the airport and she does they pay the minute that that leaves from the place of business that's constituting conducting business at the airport sir no it's not it's not on her property it's it's their vehicle when once it drives off her property. I guess we're just going to have to disagree on this. But Pardon? the city code is clear, and the city attorney's opinion and my opinion stand as it is. Well, I'd like that in writing sent to her. It's been in writing many, many times, but that's also something so we I want a with. written, like to see it in written letter, not not by email. That, that letter like will that. be sent out tomorrow, sir. That'd be fine. Thank you. Okay, airport um, director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, would you like me to respond to any of that, or are we moving on? Um, you know, I, I guess for my part, I think that uh, the city manager and the uh, city attorney will take care of sending out the letter, and I think that's probably where we're at at this point with this. Very well. So now on to the exciting topic of airport revenue which you've all been waiting for all day. Um, I wanna, I, I'm, I'm gonna go very high level with this. I'm not gonna go into the weeds of, of airport financing, but I think as we get into the budget season, it's important for you to uh, know some of the things that go on with, uh, with airport financing and the fact that although we are a municipal airport, as I've indicated, uh, we have a certain responsibility to uh, conduct our business uh, in compliance with uh, federal regulations. And in the compliance manual um, that we're required to follow uh, is the concept of self-sustainability. And what that means is the airport should be operated in such a way that we are financially self-sufficient, um, that the rates and charges and the income that we have uh, are adequate to cover our expenses. Um, and uh, when they are, that means that you, when I come up here, I just give you a glowing report of what's going on at the airport uh, every month, and I don't ask you for money. But as you've seen from agenda items uh, month after month, uh, the airport uh, uh, does rely on uh, tax revenue, uh, sales tax revenue, or tax levies uh, to fund um, part of our operation. And um, while my overriding goal is safety and security at the airport, uh, certainly at the top of the financial goals that we have, are to become self-sufficient uh, so that we op generate enough revenue uh, to cover all of our expenses and we don't require uh, any assistance from, uh, from local government. 
So for 2018, and these are approximate, and uh, as you know, the budget is just being printed, um, our revenue uh, is projected to be $8.15 million. And so I just want to run through real quickly where that revenue comes from. The majority of it comes from state and federal grants. So $2.6 million um, in, uh, in federal grants and $148,000 in state grants. Uh, those are for capital projects. Uh, and so when we do a project here, typically uh, the uh, FAA will pay 90, uh, capital project, the FAA will pay 90% of that project, uh, the state will pay uh, 5%, and uh, the local share is 5%. So uh, that, those numbers represent that 95%. Um, we collect parking fees uh, of about, uh, in 2018, we're projecting $1.6 billion. Um, passenger facility charges, those are charges that we're allowed to collect. Um, the, we are allowed to have the airlines collect on our behalf um, for uh, passengers departing um, from Minot. Um, landing fees that we charge to the airport based upon, you know, that's based upon frequency, size of aircraft. Uh, and then uh, the rent that they pay for the space that they occupy at the airport uh, is $730,000. Um, we've gone into some detail on the rental car concession um, budgeted at uh, $787,000 for 2018, so it is not an insignificant amount. Um, and, you know, not to, not to digress, but, um, you know, we have local franchisees uh, that make this commitment too, so they're, you know, they're local businesses, they employ local people as well. Um, and then the uh, CFCs, the customer facility charges, which we've already also talked about, those are collected on our behalf by the car rental companies. And so as we have things like uh, car rental parking lots to take care of or this quick turn facility or anything that um, has to do with car rentals, we have this money available to, to finance that from this uh, fee that's collected on our, on our behalf by the car rental companies. And then $130,000 for food and beverage and concession. So um, that's what the, uh, you know, the revenue is. And then the last one, this big, this big red number, $657,000, that's where we're, uh, the gap between um, the revenues that, uh, that we bring in and our expenses. And so that's what we need to close. So how does uh, an airport become self-sustaining? Well, the most important thing really is a robust and growing local economy. Um, when we have uh, um, growing businesses, when we have uh, people wanting to fly in and out of Minot, um, that, uh, that adds greatly to the cause. And it, it affects directly point number two, which is air service development. As our economy grows, uh, airlines want to come here. Airlines want to add bigger airplanes. They want to add more service, uh, and they want to add increased frequency. And all of those things that I you know, kind of go back to the last slide, uh, those direct, uh, directly correlate to landing fees, terminal rents, and uh, passenger facility charges. We want to have smart concession agreements. That means uh, finding agreements with concessionaires, whether they be car rental companies or uh, food and beverage or uh, uh, other services that we provide at the airport um, that allow the business owner to, to make a profit, uh, to be successful, but also pay us the most. You know, we, we built a beautiful uh, facility here. Uh, we want to use that to our advantage uh, to, to bring in the highest quality uh, and, the, and, and the, the most uh, income for the city. And then lastly, we talked about this uh, briefly last month, but increased focus on general aviation. We've got a great general aviation facility over there. Um, and I think that uh, with some more focus on that, that is something that can turn into more revenue than we're seeing today. Uh, with, with a little bit su more support uh, from our, uh, our standpoint. So that is my presentation for today. I would be happy to answer any questions on any of it. Questions for the airport director? Alderman Potter-Gula? I guess just the comment. I, um, in the past six months, I think I've spent about a day with you folks, and I really appreciate that opportunity. And one of the things I noticed was how business-like in the positive sense of the word I've seen your operation um, quality seems to be a number one issue customer satisfaction defined very broadly not just airline passengers but also private pilots and people like that 
and I've heard you and your staff, not just you, but your staff talk about the need to be responsive and generate income. And that's a very positive thing. I understand that you know, our police chief can't be <laughs> make generating become the goal by giving people traffic tickets. I mean, actually, that would drive us further in the hole, the way the state limits our, our fees on traffic tickets. But um, I've really been impressed with that. And I wanted to say that publicly. Um, very much customer satisfaction, business-oriented, let's make this thing pay for itself continuously and throughout every part of the airport that I've seen and everyone I've talked with. And that's a very um, pleasing uh, message for me to keep hearing. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything further? Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Um, that concludes our agenda except for, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That brings us to item 20, which is the BK Property Settlement Agreement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I pulled this just because I needed a point of clarification. Do you, on, do we, we should get a motion. Forgive me. Uh, do you want to make the motion? Make the motion. Okay. That'd be great. Second? Second. Second by Olson. Discussion. Go ahead, Alderman Strait. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I guess I just needed a point of clarification. what the dispute was all about. I, you know, I've heard from a number of people that have disputes. Okay. Our finance director is approaching. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Alderman Strait, what happened in this case is when this uh, utility count was set up, um, it's a threeplex, and it was set up, and there's a utility rate that is programmed to accommodate uh, these types of buildings, duplexes, uh, triplexes, that type of thing. And when this particular account was set up, that rate was used, but it was put in three times. So in essence, they used the rate for a threeplex and put it in three times. So they were charged for nine units and it was unnoticed. Um, what happened is eventually this account was uh, turned over to a new tenant or a, a new person that's in charge of the billing and it questioned the rate and we did some research and found out that they had been overcharged. So in order to rectify this uh, with some discussion with the uh, city manager and the city attorney, uh, we did some research, uh, statute of limitations, six years, so we went back six years. There was some uh, veiled threat of litigation uh, with this, so we did go back and do the research and the calculation, and this is just the agreement settling the overcharge uh, for the utilities and the refund. Well, yes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Mr. Lakefield, is this just something that's come of our recent kind of audits of our overall system? Is this <coughs> something that's very rare or personal experience I've had of renovating a fourplex and going through a building code change to a duplex? Um, I spoke with this a little bit with Jason. Is this something that's just happened in the past and we're just kind of cleaning it up as a result of some of that? Uh, Chairman Janser, Alderman Street, this particular case came to light uh, when a new person, when the account changed hands to an, a new person and, and they questioned the rate. Um, you know, we have discovered, um, aside from this instance, um, you know, as a result of accounts being suspended after the flood and now particularly with the change in the sanitation service, uh, uncovering some things where you know maybe they haven't unsuspended those accounts, but that's not related to this particular case. Alderman Padrigula. When I looked at the agenda, I seen I must have spaced out on this one. How much money are we talking about? Uh, I don't have the exact number. Uh, Order Chairman Janser and, and Dr. Padrigula, it's uh, just over a thousand dollars. Okay, I thanks. Believe it was. Okay. Any further questions for our finance director? Seeing none. Um, any further? Thank you. Um, any further discussion from the uh, committee? Seeing none, call the roll. Straight? Yes. Chancer? Yes. Olson? Yes. Patricula? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Barney? Yes. Okay, motion carried. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our agenda, except for one very important announcement from our city manager. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
Uh, I just wanted to remind uh, the committee and those in the audience uh, that it is National Night Out this evening, and I wanted to encourage your attendance. It has already started at 5.30. It's over at the uh, Minot High School at the uh, Magic City campus. Uh, parking's on the, it's on the north side. Uh, that uh, National Night Out is a celebration uh, that promotes public safety and gives recognition to those individuals and agencies who keep our community safe. And so I'm sure your attendance there would be most appreciated by our law enforcement officers and those in the community. So I'll uh, see you there if you end up coming. It's a great event. So with no further business, we're